too, Gary. That was wonderful. Will you pray with me? God of abundant blessings and life, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you this day, now and forever, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Water has a depth to it. Kind of sounds silly to say, but one of those things we don't often think about until we are waist deep, neck deep, it's over our head. You see, if you've ever been to a beach or if you have ever been in a swimming pool, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And I am a lover of water. I spent most of my life in the water in one way, shape, or form. I was extremely lucky to have a neighbor that had a wonderful in-ground pool that I learned to swim in when I was about my son's age, about four or five. And ever since then, I, it's hard to get me out of the water if I have a chance to be in it. But just like everybody else, I always start right at that shoreline or in what we might call the shallow end of the pool. A place where you can kind of stick your toe in and just get it wet or, you know, if you're standing on the shoreline of the beach as the waves come over and it's just cresting gently across your feet. It's a wonderful thing. It's a, a foretaste of what is to come. And as you step out a little ways and the water starts to get up to your ankles, still feeling nice. It's still feeling refreshing. You can walk. You can look down and see, you know, if you're on the beach, you can see the stones and you can see the seashells and, and it's kind of a, a leisurely walk. But as you get a little bit deeper and you get up to your waist, it gets harder to walk. Can't move quite as easy. You're need to start to make a commitment. Are you going to go out further? Or are you going to turn around and go back to the shore or the shallow end? And as you keep moving a little bit deeper into that water and it starts to get up to your chest, you start to realize that you're in the thick of it now, right? It's not as easy to move even from side to side. You kind of start to feel that water up underneath your armpits and you start to realize that now if you go out any further, you really are going to have to make a commitment to swim because your feet are no longer going to be able to touch. And as you start going out even further and you start getting up on your tiptoes and the water is starting to come up, right to the chin, you know that at any moment you're going to go under. And you'll have a choice. You can either sink or you can swim. And then finally you have to make that decision. You can either dive in and begin to do whatever we need to stay afloat, whether that's doggy paddle or, or uh, do, the, do the float or actually start full force with our arms and our legs kicking and churning, moving that water. But that's our choice of how we move forward because their option is always to move back to safer ground, to shallower water. And the reason that I love 
Jesus' baptism story so much is because of the symbolism of water. Jesus comes down to the shoreline of the Jordan where there are already hundreds of people who have come to be baptized by John. And we realize that there is not only a depth to water, but there is a depth to baptism. For John admits that his baptism is of repentance. He says, this baptism of which I give to you is to help you to understand that God is near. God's kingdom is near. That God is present in and around us and that it's our choice to change our lives, to turn back to God. That's what repent means, to turn back. And so John is baptizing people for a forgiveness of sin. To help them know that they are washed clean. To begin again. To begin anew. To begin to walk with God in a different way than they had before their baptism. But then everything changes. Jesus himself, God's Son, Emmanuel, who we know as God made flesh, comes down to the shoreline. And our expectation is that God in flesh, the Christ, would be the one doing all the baptizing, right? So how then can we not sympathize or empathize with John when there's this look of disbelief to say, you are coming to be baptized by me? But you, Jesus, should be baptizing me, shouldn't you? Shouldn't it be the other way around? How can this be? But Jesus says, no. This is the way it has to be. And so, John, as we saw in the video clip, baptizes Jesus with an immersion baptism. Where Jesus is fully put under the water. And I like the way the camera angle was in that shot where you actually see John's face there through the water as it's coming up so you actually feel like you're underneath that water because it symbolizes that change that John is talking about that death to an old life and that birth to a new way of living. And this was a grace-filled act. And it was a grace-filled act for John. Because in it and through it, John was confirmed in his ministry. that he could help others to understand the call and the claim upon their own lives, could help them understand the love of God because he was given the authority to do that. Not only for others, but for Jesus himself. grace-filled act. And in an immersion baptism, we don't really get the choice 
of what level of water we're going to wade into. When we make a commitment to be immersed in baptism, we are fully put underneath. And we've already made that commitment to swim, to come back up, to get our head above water so that we can be those new persons that God calls us to be. To go out and offer and share that grace and that love of Christ with other people. Now, let me give you a story of how that can happen. In our lives before baptism, There's always a question. A question about God's love for us. And I know that each of us could probably think of a time in our lives where we have really questioned maybe where God is, where God's love can be found. I know many people who are struggling with addictions in their lives, whether that be to alcohol or to drugs, to gambling, whatever it might be, but it has such a grip and such a hold on their life that they can't see any other way. And I knew a woman in Pennsylvania who was very much struggling with an addiction in her life. One in which she often found herself broke, alone, feeling like she didn't have anyone to turn to, family, friends. But that wasn't the case. She had a lot of people who were looking out for her, who loved her, but she couldn't see that. All she could see was that she was sinking deeper and deeper into a water that she wasn't choosing or she thought she wasn't choosing. And she and I talked a lot about baptism. She had not been baptized as a child. She had not been raised in the church. She really didn't have much of a history or a relationship with Christ, but there was something And I, to this day, couldn't tell you or explain to you more than just to say it was the voice of God deep within her soul calling out to her to say, try something different. Try something new. Go and talk to this pastor, this new guy in town. And just talk. And so we shared about life and we shared about the church and we talked about baptism. And I felt a little bit like Philip, the disciple Philip, who came alongside the servant of the queen, as we hear about in the book of Acts, and opened up the scripture to a point where she herself wanted to be baptized. 
And we talked about what that would mean. Because baptism does have a call and a claim upon our lives. Baptism calls us to enter into deeper waters. Baptism calls us to commit ourselves in a different way. Baptism calls us to take some leaps and some risks of faith. But along our way, we know and we can be assured of the promise that God goes with us on that journey. No matter how deep we get into the water, even when it feels like we're at neck level, even when it feels like it's going over our head, we can trust that God is with us through it all. And that God will never let go of us, even when that water seems to be swimming over our head. Now, I can't tell you exactly what has happened to that woman. Because sometimes in ministry, you come in contact with people for a short while. And God places us in the path of one another for a short while. And maybe that's the first message they need to hear. Maybe that's the first grace-filled act they need to experience is somebody listening and somebody sharing their faith with them, somebody just hearing what level of water they are in, and then sharing with them our own faith and our own stories of coming out of the water. But I believe that her baptism changed her. It was nothing I did. It was nothing the water did. But it was exactly as it happens to each and every one of us. It was God's Spirit that provided the change and the transformation to begin again. To know that to that old way of life, it's dead, it's buried, it's gone. We are free, free to begin again. But this time, in the knowledge and the promise of God's love, that's a huge change. And that is the promise of the baptism of the Spirit. For what we did not see, but which we read about in Scripture, is that immediately following Jesus' baptism, the heavens are torn open and the Spirit, as if like a dove, comes down and rests upon Jesus. It is the first time that we see the Spirit at live, alive and at work in the world. But it will certainly not be the last. And we will see another baptism by the Spirit on the day of Pentecost as the disciples receive the coming of the Holy Spirit. And we, too, through our own baptism, Receive that gift of the Holy Spirit, which activates in us the love and the light of Christ. For within us is the love of God, and the Holy Spirit is what helps us to take that and to share it with the world. 
Now, I can look out at the congregation this morning, and I know that many of you and most of you have experienced the gift of grace and baptism. Some may not yet be baptized. And I want you to know that I'm always here to talk with you about that and to help you to see when it might be right for you to experience that gift of grace and baptism. But for those of us who have been baptized, we know that it's a once and for all thing. We don't need to experience it each and every time we think we need to start over in life. We just need to remember it. We need to remember what it feels like. And for some of us that were baptized as infants, we need to be reminded of what those waters felt like. So I warned you that you might get wet this morning. And if you don't get wet, don't worry. It doesn't mean that God's avoiding you. It means I don't have very good aim. But I want us to feel these waters again. And as I come by and as I share this showering of blessings of water, that if you have many drops or one drop, to let that water just run down your cheek or your forehead or your hand or wherever it may land and symbolically feel that grace drenching you, that love of God washing over you. Will you sing with me? Jesus loves me, this I know.
let us be drenched in the grace of God and let us know that God's love surrounds us and that we are free to go and share that love with others. And will you stand with me now and sing to that promise of God's amazing grace?